Well, good afternoon and welcome to this special symposium by Russian Studies on Hashtag Politics and the New Media in Putin's Russia. My name is Gene Husky. I'm the chair of the political science department, but I guess more importantly for today, I'm a member of the Russian Studies program at Stetson. We have an exciting opportunity this afternoon to explore the intersection of technology, language, and politics in contemporary Russia. This is a particularly fitting topic for Russian studies, for the Russian studies program at Stetson, whose mission is to encourage thinking that transcends disciplinary boundaries. We're very fortunate to have with us today two of the country's leading specialists on the new media in Russia, Sarah Oates and Michael Gorham. After completing a PhD at Emory under Ellen Mishkevich, Professor Oates taught for many years in the Department of Politics at the University of Glasgow before returning to the United States last year to take up a position as professor and senior scholar at the University of Maryland's Philip Merrill College of Journalism. She's written widely on post-communist democratization and communications, and she serves as an expert for the European Commission's Digital Futures Project. Her latest book, Revolution Stall, The Political Limits of the Internet and the Post-Soviet Sphere, I was going to say will be published next month by Oxford University Press, but here it is, already uh, out. We're very pleased to see that. For this audience, I should also add that Professor Oates spent part of her early career in Central Florida. After graduating with a BA in English and Russian from Yale, she worked for a time as a journalist for the Orlando Sentinel. And during this period, she studied Russian politics as a visiting student at Stetson. And we were reminiscing about our days up in the John John's room here in the early 1990s. So welcome back. Michael Gorham teaches Russian studies at the University of Florida and is the um, associate editor of the Russian Review. His early work was as a specialist in language and politics in early 20th century Russia. And in recent years, he's done path-breaking work on the media revolution in contemporary Russia. Um, among his recent articles is Medvedev's New Media Gambit, The Language of Power in 140 Characters or Less. He's a reference that may be lost on some of the older members of the audience. Um, he's just completed a book manuscript entitled New Speaks Weight, Language, Culture, and Politics from Glasnost to Social Media. We've been trying for some time to get Michael over from Gainesville, and we are delighted that he could join us today for this symposium. The format today is for each of the speakers to speak for about 25 to 30 minutes, and then we'll open it up to questions and discussion for about a half an hour, and we'll start with Sarah.
high level sort of which country has what percentage of internet. There isn't a lot of research that talks about how the internet might function differently in different countries. There's a lot of assumptions about the internet that it's going to liberalize the country, it's going to allow people to be more democratic in some way, but there's not an awful lot of specific research. Uh, there's a lot of speculation. And then, if you're studying the internet in the United States, for example, can you generalize that to Russia and vice versa? It's difficult. So again, you're sort of trapped in this conundrum. If you really want to understand what's going on on the Russian internet, you don't have a lot of pathways to follow. I just took this as a challenge, you know, because that's the way I am. You know, why do things the easy way? Why study something where there are rules? Let's just make them up as we go. Um, there's other problems in studying the internet as well. Is it a cause or an effect? Do people vote for Obama because they were online, or did they go online in order to support Obama? That's sort of an American question. Um, how do you separate, how do you make good research questions? What questions should we be asking about the internet? And what questions should we ask, be asking about the internet's effect on Russian politics? Um, and the final one, and this is a tough one, political scientists, like, and you know this from your class, you know, they think a certain way. They think about politics as being within certain political institutions. When you think politics, um, particularly if you're a student of political science, you think president, you think Congress, you think maybe media, uh, you think voting. Those are all sort of standard political things. But if you're of the younger generation, you embrace what many people call liquid modernity. And this is this idea that the political and the social are merged. When you're on Facebook with your friends and you're talking about meeting up later and someone says, oh, by the way, is anyone going to that Obama rally or is anyone going to the Mitt Romney rally? I, I assume there were some. Um, you know, would you like to come? So the political and the social and even the commercial, because you're talking on Facebook, you're talking on a commercial platform, right, are merged in ways that we don't really understand and that political scientists aren't particularly geared up to understand. For example, we often think of Facebook and Twitter as political, but that's not what they're designed to be. They're businesses, they're corporations, they have a profit motive. That's fine, you know, they're capitalists, we understand that. Yet by accident, they wind up playing really important political roles. So again, this is something we don't really understand. So now that I've laid out all the fun stuff, so in, a, in, a, in what I would call a desperate attempt to make some sense of this, because I had a contract and a deadline, which reminds me of an old joke we had at the Orlando Sentinel, which is, what makes a story? And one was, a source and a deadline is the answer. Another answer was, a deadline and, a, and an editor. <laughs> so, yeah, things do get uh, occasionally, shall we say, not made up exactly, but for me. So, what's, okay, so uh, the nickname for the Russian internet is RUNET, um, so it's an obvious abbreviation. Even that, by the way, is a little bit, um, what we would say, it's, it's actually a little bit, contentious, uh, but not everyone agrees that the Russian internet should be called something different. So I looked at five different aspects of the Russian internet uh, for my new book, which would make a lovely Mother's Day present, or perhaps some deep <laughs> reading. Um, although I think at $55 you probably know that that's a joke. Um, so I looked at the content of the internet, I looked at the way people build communities online, I looked at the effect of catalysts, uh, such as protests, or uh, storms or fires or other events have on the internet. Uh, I looked at the way in which the government attempted to control the internet in a particular Russian style. And I also looked at co-optation a, a, a very little bit, which is when uh, the government attempts to subvert the state. The, the best known case is when they, they try to influence major bloggers into either not being so aggressive or inactive. So what did we, uh, what are we intending to do? Here's the really big question, and this is a question that is particularly gripped the Obama administration, uh, but it's really going all the way back to the Clinton administration. The idea that information equals democracy. Now, as Americans, we're probably pretty comfortable with that idea. The idea that in order to have informed, engaged citizens, what well, they need information, and that information generally comes from the media. And it's this model that, to this day, the State Department thinks is incredibly important. I don't think this model works. I don't think if you give, just give Russian citizens more information, they'll become more like Americans. Now, that sounds ridiculous when you say it out loud, less ridiculous when you're applying for a grant from the State Department. Uh, but that's, in many ways, the idea. And that idea just doesn't help us very much. So I wanted to get it out there on the table, though, and, and think about it. So we also have to think about the fact that political institutions, which are beginning to learn in your class, and which you'll continue to learn, political institutions in Russia, they may be called the president, 
Russia is still ruled by a narrow oligarchy. Um, and actually, Professor Hussey and I could debate that a little bit as to whether it's more narrow or less narrow or, or whatever. <coughs> there's a lack of rule of law. There's weak parties in the parliament. There's endemic corruption. Russia is right, right up there with Nigeria in terms of corruption. And corruption is perhaps the elephant in the living room, the issue that for Russia uh, is, is really getting in the way of democratic growth and change. Uh, journalism is under development profession. There's not a societal understanding that journalists play a watchdog role. As much as everyone likes to rag on journalists from CNN to Fox, um, they do play a watchdog role in American society. The traditional mass media are fairly well controlled, mostly through self-censorship and fear, as opposed to overt censorship. Uh, but the internet is not. The internet is still ranked as, as pretty free, both by observers such as myself and by places such as Freedom House. Now, whereas the other countries that had a non-free uh, traditional mass media, television in particular, but had a partly free or mostly free internet, why, that would be Egypt. So that's interesting. So is it, and Egypt also had massive growth, but not widespread penetration of the internet. So those are the two things to think about. Is it growth, explosive growth? Some Russian scholars would argue with me about the final point. They would say I'm being Western centric, um, and I'm not really recognizing a different tradition of right, but in terms of how Westerners define right, the right to uh, free speech, the right to habeas corpus, those are not well entrenched uh, as rights within the, the Russian uh, political culture. These are the chains on the other side, which I'm sure you probably all read by now, but that won't stop me from reading in my files. Um, all of these things. All five points, and I'm actually hoping that you can speak more to the protest and the protest voice because I think this, this is a little weak on that. Um, state TV no longer has a dominant voice, and that's kind of lacking for us because for anyone under 40 in the room, probably television, or okay, we'll say 30, television isn't probably a dominant political force in your life, but it certainly was for my generation. Um, and it's sometimes a little bit hard to get across how big a change that is. If you have, if you're the government and there's three television networks that you need to influence, you can do that. But if you're in government and there's a vast array of cable, satellite, there's Fox, there's CNN, there's MSNBC, there's a whole bunch I probably don't know about, there's online sources, there's the Huffington Post, there's all these things, you, there's no longer a dominant switch that you can manipulate. Maybe you didn't manipulate it that well, but it was still there. Uh, so audiences are fragmented, and that makes things more challenging in the West, but particularly for Russia, which has to maintain this dominant narrative of culture and power in order to mask a lot of the day-to-day -day unfairness and problems, it becomes quite problematic. Um, can the internet inform and mobilize in Russia? It certainly can inform and mobilize in new and different ways, and I think the studies, including my book, um, <laughs> well, I, actually, a whole bunch of people I quote in my book, so I mean, to be totally fair, it's in the book. Uh, and can we have evolution rather than revolution? I shall soon know from Professor Hessen's class. That's just not how Russians roll. Um, but maybe we're missing that because we, we keep thinking, well, if there's no change in Russia because there's not tanks in the streets. Maybe there is change going on. Maybe citizens are being rewired. Maybe the new generation is learning how to speak up for their rights and learning how to assert themselves politically and changing their expectations of their contract with the state uh, by learning on the learning on the internet. So what we do see as well, and, and what um, my research has suggested, if you look hard enough, you'll find people talking about rights. Right. So here's the key findings from the recent work. First, um, evidence that the internet is linked, using the internet is linked to more skepticism about the regime. 
sort of driving people to the internet. And unsurprisingly, uh, a wealth of fascinating and interesting places to go on the Russian internet. Russia is the eighth most used language on the internet. Uh, last time I checked. Uh, so lots of content. Anyone who has Russian friends won't be surprised. Russians produce content. It's something I love about them. Um, mobile phones and Russians are uh, very quick to adapt and use mobile phones. And sometimes even they don't have smartphones, the survey found that they will still go online um, in, a, in a more permanent way. And you have in Russia a well-educated and attentive media audience. You know, it's, it, it would be naive and not useful to think of the Russians as being particularly prone to propaganda. Russia, many, as Alan McKay's work has shown earlier what I did in focus groups with Russian media users, they make sophisticated and interesting trade-offs about their media use. They often are not convinced that they're being duped or fooled, but I think the explosion of the internet and uh, the, the greater amount of information almost creates a, a ripple effect that, that will bring something new and different. Good afternoon. How, uh, how is the, uh, the sound in the back? You hear okay? All right. I'll use the mic. Uh, first of all, uh, Professor Husky, thank you very much for having me down. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, it's, I've been here before, but not in this capacity, and it's a, it's a, it's a fine excuse to come down again. The last visit was to see Master. I'm not a political scientist, even though I write a little bit about politics. So I'm as interested. 
interested in the rhetorical side of the equation. Uh, and this, this study is part of a, of, of a new project that I'm working on. The uh, book that I have coming out this year uh, ends with the Snow Revolution of 2011, 2004, or 2012. Now the opening line of the Ross Guibri, or Ru a Russia election website, <laughs> asks visitors, how can you make sure that your vote in the elections is not brazenly stolen? Elections that I'm referring to uh, are the elections of uh, December 2011 through March 2012. Now, in Russian, the word for vote, golos, also means voice, and is closely linked etymologically to plasmos, or openness, the policy of mass communication, commonly associated with perestroika. Reform. Much of the events of 2011 2012 election cycle can be understood as a battle not only for elections, but for openness, for access to information, for the ability to speak out, to share in the open one's opinion, no matter how critical of the ruling authority. And given the central role of the internet, and the role it played in allowing this de debate to resurface in a very public way, one could argue that we were, and perhaps still are witnessing, something of a glossmas 2.0. In fact, Russia is the second, based on a report I saw yesterday, the second most common language on the internet now. This is a Russian language source, Lentaru, but it was embracing the fact that, uh, that Russia has, has burst up there. So the trend that Dr. Oates was talking about is, is still very, very, very powerful. Uh, that being said, there, there are, are, are major caveats. Just as with the earlier glossness, the exact nature of the openness, however, depends considerably on who you ask and their attitude toward the current political state of affairs. For those closer to the center of authority, or in Russian what's called last, it tends to assume a more modest form of opening up the spigot of information, just enough to give the population a sense of buy-in over policy decisions that are still made and shaped by those at the top. For those on or beyond the margins of officialdom, though, lastness takes on a more radical form, an invitation to question test to use one's vote and voice to transform glass significantly. Now closely linked to this tension is the battle of the proper role of the internet in Russian politics. Perhaps the oldest view sees the internet as an outpost for activism and oppositional discourse and one of the only remaining such outposts in a media as we've just heard dominated by Kremlin frankly, self-censorship. A second view comes in the form of what former President Dmitry Medvedev calls direct internet democracy, uh, a mechanism for bringing the state into sync with the opinions and needs of the population. And finally, a third view the political role of the internet might be described as a kind of sovereign internet, where some effort is made to harness the more interactive but with a keen eye toward information security and promoting the interests of the authority. Now I'd like to discuss here the first of these models mainly on the internet as an outpost for oppositional discourse and perhaps we can turn to the other two in, 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 our, in our discussion period. I'd suggest in any case that these different models often rely on different types of public political communication and employ different technological and rhetorical strategies to promote their views on glossness, on public expression, and on the rightful place of the internet in these processes. Now, recent world events have shown that new media technologies are neither democratic nor authoritarian by nature or design, depending on a variety of factors, cultural, political, technological, they have the capacity to both aid and suppress revolution. That said, web 2.0 technologies such as blogs, social networking, and crowdsourcing 
sites nearly always begin as alternative spaces, and as such, naturally attract oppositional voices. In the United States, political blogging grew out of a frustration with the mainstream coverage of the television and print media for being just that, too mainstream, be it from the left or from the right. This has especially been the case in Russia, where Vladimir Putin and associates have maintained tight control over print media and broadcast television, especially. Yeah. Now, if in this country, uh, in the country of its origin, live journals served mainly as an outlet for earnest teens sharing their innermost thoughts and problems with the rest of the world, the Russian language version, Zhivoy uh, Journal, or simply zhe, zhe as it's known as in Russia, has always had a strongly politicized orientation, and to this day remains the home of the most influential political blogger in Russia. In the early days of the Russian internet, the space was additionally marked as a, as a technology that had been largely imported from the West, and thus seen as a bit exotic, perhaps suspicious. Now, the 2000s have seen a considerable nativization of the Russian language internet to the extent that, as Dr. Oates pointed out, it is, is often viewed and referred to as our Runet, our Russian internet. But that being said, American-born social networking platforms such as Facebook and Twitter still carry an air of exoticness that in some quarters give rise to, to suspicion. I refer to comments by the uh, director of Vladimir Putin's uh, re-election campaign, Stanislav Gavryukhin, last winter, who referred to the internet as a pamoyka in Russian, a garbage dump controlled by the United States State Department. Now, all of these communication platforms have become political game changers in Russia on at least three different levels, sharing information, shaping public opinion, and organization. I'd like to focus on the first two of these. As an alternative, more open source of information, the internet has created a turbocharged version of the more narrow definition of glossiness, sharing information about government operations with the citizens. And the big difference is that the decentralized architecture of Web 2.0 technology allows for any citizen journalist to contribute to the open flow of information. It's this more rhizomatic communicative structure that has given rise to the phenomenon of Alexei Navalny, a particularly well-qualified citizen journalist, thanks to his legal training and dogged pursuit of federal corruption. Navalny first made a name for himself through his investigative blog and net-based exposés of the embezzlement of billions of dollars of state funds in the Transnet oil pipeline construction project, efforts which ultimately forced then Prime Minister Putin to launch a formal investigation. The first of Navalny's web-based citizen watchdog projects took the form of something called Rospil, uh, an interactive site that allows citizens to report official, official mismanagement of federal funds mm. and track cases uh, that, and, and, and as they progress through various stages of civic and legal confrontation. I'll get to the name in a second. The second of Navalny's projects, uh, Rossiyama, was initiated later in 2011 and took on the more mundane but very popular uh, uh, bugaboo of the dilapidated state of Russia's roads. Uh, both projects rely on Web 2.0 technology that enables end users, citizens, to report cases of bureaucratic mismanagement and trace progress and outcomes of ensuing investigations. The user, the user simply needs to click on report a dubious government purchase button and fills in the details and the Rospil legal staff handles it from there. Monitor the case's status through the state order button, check out the overall legal amount that has been saved due to reports on the site, and even make a contribution online to progress. If it's a gaping pothole you want to report, you follow the similar sequence of steps as the other site, reporting the location of the road problem, uploading a photograph to document the municipal negligence. If there's no fix within 37 days, you click on send your complaint to the public prosecutor's office and that office is obliged to respond. Now a 
aside from providing citizens with powerful crowdsourcing tools that lodge complaints publicly, these and related Navalny-inspired projects offer potent symbolic fodder for anti-government sentiment. The names themselves enlist the beloved bureaucratic stump compound, pairing the, com the common initial syllable for existing state agencies, ROS, from Brasilia, for instance, ROS Atom, the atomic, uh, Federal Atomic, atomic Agency, uh, ROS Nano, the Federal Agency for Nanotechnology, with a second component that introduces a parodic element in the Navalny case uh, to the formula, PIL, from the slang PILIS, meaning to saw, literally, but figuratively to skim. And YAMA is the Russian word. Put together, they give name to a general frustration shared by a large portion of the population, including many wired and middle class white collar workers, that the government is currently not serving the needs of the population and is quite likely lining its pockets generously in the process. They at the same time serve as a, a surrogate, if not subversive government, that it, in contrast to the actual government is, is directly addressing those unmet needs. The nominal parodies are likewise accompanied by logos that usurp state symbols to bring legitimacy to the cause, while at the same time modifying them to highlight the corruption of the state. Now it's this deft ability to pinpoint issues of popular discontent, articulate them in coherent, satirical language, and package them in web, web technology web technologies that maximize the power of the internet for decentralized aggregation of information that makes Navalny such a potent player in contemporary politics. Now, in addition to serving as a fourth multiplier in the narrower sense of philosophers, the swift, open, decentralized dissemination of information, the internet has changed the rules of the game as far as influencing public opinion go. Many observers have noted the high level of creativity <laughs> invested in protest expressions, a, a sign of the relatively well-educated urban demographic of the protest population, but also an indication of their web savviness. Astute WooNet users know full well that entertaining content makes it far more likely that a political statement will get any sort of sustained attention online total number of daily internet users in Russia is now around 43%. According to recent studies of the population, that's slightly over 50 million people, uh, not an insignificant number. Uh, a much smaller portion, as uh, Dr. Ellis pointed out, devotes attention while they're to politics. Ever the web entrepreneur Navalny launched an online contest in September 2011, building up to the parliamentary election offering 300,000 rubles in cash prizes for the best anti-United Russia musical video produced in the months running up to the December Duma election. United Russia being the party of Putin, the party of power. The contest resulted in 116 entries over five hours of content and a top 10 list of YouTube videos that received over three million hits in three months. First prize of 100,000 rubles nothing to sniff at, went to the song Our Crazy House Votes for Putin, Nash Gurdom Galasuit Za Putina, by the well-established band Rob Fox, who went on to post a series of anti-Putin tunes that all went viral. In the weeks just following the September 11, 2011 announcement of Putin's plans to run for president, and in conjunction with his impending 59th birthday, Russian Twitter users organized in flash mob fashion, fashion around the hashtag Ispasiba Putin Zayeta, and thanks to Putin for that. A satirical echo of the Soviet ditty for Chastushka Ushla Zima Nastala Yeta Spasiba Parti Zayeta, winter is gone, spring has come, thanks to the party for that. You know, the battle, the battle for poetic creativity turned out to be as fierce as that for political irony, uh, leading to such gems as, and this is poetry, so I have to read it in Russian. The translations are for you on the screen. The screen. 
Стабильность есть, свободы нету. Спасибо Путину за это. Снова ночь, мы ждем рассвета. Спасибо Путину за это. Воды в общаге утром нету. Спасибо Путину за это. Aside from its uh, potential for creative expression, the hashtag in general has become a potent alternative to the centralized, more institutional form of political communication. Searching it, following it, or adding it to your tweet will automatically connect you to like-minded tweeters without having to friend or to join. It combines networking with political satire. The fact that your tag appears alongside of thousands of others offers confirmation that your political sentiments are publicly shared by citizens from all across Russia and the world, of course. We saw a similarly unifying effect in the spread of the internet meme party of crooks and thieves in Russian party Zhulikov Ivarov, the pejorative nickname for the United Russia Party that went viral in the winter of 2011. More than any other web-based protest action, the coining and codification of this term and its acronym, Peje Iver, has arguably been the single most potent rhetorical blow to the authority and prestige of the party of power in Russia. Its birth is owed also to blogger Navalny, who first used it in passing during the February 2011 internet and radio interview. The meme went viral early, in part because United Russia defender called out Navalny on his characterization. Duma representative Yevgeny Fyodor agreed to a debate among the same radio station, thereby ensuring the further circulation of the term. Later that year, United Russia member Vladimir Svinin sued Navalny for, uh, for one million rubles as compensation for moral harm, moralny vred, bringing further publicity to the term. Not only did the, the court find his accusations unfounded, essentially legalizing the term in the process, the public relations from the case further boosted the meme's legitimacy, providing it attention in mainstream media as well as online. Peje Iver, Partia Judikov Ivarov, eventually became a favorite theme of anti-establishment campaign posters of all stripes. Don't let yourself be caught and not feeding the bear united Russia party of crooks and thieves, this poster reads, the bear being the symbol of the party. Check your vision. And if you read through it, you read part, party of crooks and thieves in Russia. Let's clean up Moscow of its crooks and thieves. This, a billboard, right, into the real world, the meme's emergence on a campaign poster of a communist party a political candidate. The sticker on the windshield of the car, United Russia is the party of crooks and thieves, honk if you agree. <coughs> And a, uh, a banner posted at the, at the entryway of a, an apartment complex, a rent a, a entrance forbidden to bums, rabid dogs, and agitators for United Russia, referring to it as the uh, party of crooks and thieves. Type the word party in Cyrillic into a Google search window, and the party of crooks and thieves appears first in the list of suggested phrases. Follow that top link and you arrive at the actual United Russia website. But one nevertheless sporting the Cyrillic URL, Partia Zhulika Pivarov, Party of Crooks and Thieves. RF. Now, it would certainly be an overstatement to attribute the United Russia's decline in popularity over the past two years solely to Navalny and his, and his meme. The party's actions deserve a fair bit of credit. But the arrival of the phrase and its viral spread across multiple layers of internet technology provided a timely and expressive means of labeling that discontent with its poetic rhyme scheme, two dactylic feet with a single anapest at the end, and its nod to the time-honored vices of Russia, Russian officialdom, the uh, party of crooks and thieves succinctly articulated Russia's, Russia's general skepticism toward ruling authorities or, or blocks. 
The last link was even acknowledged by Putin himself, who felt compelled to allude to it in the wake of United Russia's poor showing in the December 2011 election. And I quote Putin here, they say the party of crooks, the party of power is a party linked to thievery, corruption. If you remember the Soviet years, who was in power then? They were all called thieves and corruptionists too. And in the 90s, the same thing. It's the stamp not of a concrete political force, it is the stamp of power. Now given that Putin's main strategy with regard to the opposition had traditionally been to ignore it altogether in public, the mere fact of his explanation is noteworthy. It's not coincidental, then, that four months after the meme's presence in the public sphere, Putin announced the formation of the All-Russian People's Front, Obsherasiski Narodny Front, an umbrella movement whose stated purpose was to extend the political authority uh, to a broader coalition of pro-Putin forces. And from that time on, in the election season, it was the symbols of the People's Front, not of United Russia, that appeared on all of Putin's campaign material. By way of summary, then, the anti-Putin protest voice enjoys broad web-based coverage in part due to the oppositional nature of the Kulunet culture itself, in part due to the diverse technologies the movement has employed, and in part due to its rhetorical flair, its ability to embed a sharply critical discourse of protest and opposition in creative contexts that garner mass appeal among internet users and spill over into traditional mass media. So given this wave of publicity, Putin and his supporters have had ever harder time ignoring, and there are a variety of strategies they've used to respond to this. I, I summarize it in, in the larger version uh, of this presentation, and it's something we might talk about in the discussion uh, sections, but just simply to tick them off, one strategy is to try to fight fire with fire, putting out humorous satirical stuff that happens to support uh, the Kremlin and its causes. Dismissing all of this oppositional speech as, as palaver, as mere words and opposing them, contrasting it to the actual deeds that have been achieved by the members of the United Russia Pact Party. One of the more common tactics of the old Soviet apparatchiki during the Glasnost days as well. Uh, another strategy is uh, taking, taking political technology digital, uh, using botnets, uh, spamming, trolling, astroturfing, and other fun things to manipulate rhetoric on the, dis on, on the internet and essentially an attempt to contaminate the environment to the extent that nobody wants to go there at all. And then two, I think, more sustained strategies that are most interesting to follow. One is what might be called the open government approach or e-government approach that has been uh, espoused by Dmitry Medvedev and that is not going to go away even when Medvedev done, it does, which seems to be any time in, in the next weeks or months. This is trying to make government useful, concrete, practical stuff for giving a, a nice face and kind face to the state in a way of helping people in electronic environments. And the final strategy, which unfortunately we've seen a lot of since uh, May of 2012 when Putin was uh, installed into his third term, is what I call dictatorship of law 2.0. That was his, his campaign slogan way back in 2000. And there's been a raft of legislation that's been brought forth in an attempt to make it very, very punitive to engage in this sort of oppositional discourse, not only on the streets, illegally, but also electronic environment. Let me, let me uh, stop there and then we can perhaps continue this in, in a more give and take environment. Thank you. Thanks, for, and thanks very much. Two very stimulating presentations. We've got about 20 or 30 minutes to discuss it, and so I want to open it up and have students first ask questions. Yeah, John. Sure. Um, one of the things that
struck me about uh, the Bukowski piece was more um, Professor Ed, was the speed in which um, Russia um, wired in over the course of the 2000, um, I think it was 2000 percent or something like that. Um, and I had the exact opposite reaction. I thought, wow, only 2000 percent? Um, this, um, like, we know that um, countries can go online really quickly. Russia is a very urban country where if you set up the infrastructure in one place, then everyone can get online real, really quickly. And so for me, to me, 50% is a low number um, for Russia to be online. And uh, um, that's, a, that's, a, that's a percentage of people online in Russia. Um, and it seems that most of those people would be in Petersburg and Moscow. So why isn't the rest of the country online? Okay, first of all, perspective in that Russia was the fastest growing internet update in Europe during that time. Okay, so also. Uh, but hold on, I mean, how many of that was? The, how much of that is due to the fact that Europe went online in the nineties? Yeah. Or not? Oh, you mean that kind of a catch-up? Uh, no, 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 no.
relatively critical. The, the folks who 